My name is Quinn Caldwell, and this is my piece, Family Singalong. It's based on Mary's Magnificat from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 and 47, where it says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. I remember my mother teaching me to sing Silent Night. I remember my sister teaching me, O come all ye faithful. I remember how much my grandmother loved the little drummer boy. And so I love it too. As soon as Mary gets together with her relative Elizabeth, she starts to sing a Christmas song. We don't know where she learned it or who taught it to her or if Elizabeth knew it too or if they had ever sung it together before. But I bet neither of them ever forgot that moment. So who taught you the songs of this season? At whose knee or on whose breast did you first breathe them in? Whose face appears before you whenever you hear them? Today, sing a carol or two for all the Elizabeths out there, the family members, whether they be blood or otherwise, with whom you've given voice to the faith of this season. Sing for Jesus, of course, but sing for what we learned in him, too, the nurture of a fathering God, the strength of a mother in God, the delight of a wacky aunt or a zany uncle God, the love of an adopting God. If you're lucky enough to be able to do it, go find the person that taught you the song or call him and ask him to sing with you. If you can't reach her anymore, sing with her anyway and praise God's holy name. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for the family that taught my soul to magnify you. Hear me as I sing your praises with them today. Amen. Welcome to the first Sunday of Advent from Darkwood Brew. Glad you could join us this evening at that place where Darkwood Brew combines ancient Christian mystical practice with modern interactive web technology, jazz, arts, biblical scholarship, and, well, you never know exactly what's going to happen here. So Quinn Caldwell invited us to uh, think back to our early memories of Christmas, how they were formed, and who sang them to us. We'll be exploring uh, Christmas, uh, this episode, through song, uh, and also comparing that to the grand symphony of salvation that's painted in Matthew's genealogy story and in Mary's Magnificat story, uh, a piece in the Gospel of Luke. Stay tuned for some pretty interesting surprises tonight as we explore Christmas with Still Speaking Writers Group member Quinn Caldwell. But before we go any further, let's invite the band to take us in to Darkwood Brew. so much. That's great. We start our time together today with our Numa Divina, which is the central scripture passage that we share together each week. And this week, we're fortunate that Quinn Caldwell will be able to uh, be here, not just by Skype, but also to share the, that scripture passage with us. Our scripture this week comes from the Gospel of Luke. It is Mary's Magnificat, and it is Luke chapter 1, verses 46 
to 55. So let's listen together now with Quinn. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for she has looked with favor on the lowliness of her servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. Her mercy is for those who fear her from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. She has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lonely. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise she made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever and ever. Amen. Amen, indeed. Thanks, Quinn. That was great. Look forward to talking with you in just a, a few minutes. So. Pretty Yay. good. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to hearing from Quinn. Uh, Quinn was on uh, Dark with Brew last year about this time during Advent as well, mm -hmm. and uh, was was fantastic. And and uh, look forward to hearing more. Yeah, he's written a couple pieces in the devotional this time around in the Behold devotional for the UCC Writers Group, and they're all quite fun. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this year uh, we, we uh, got inspired uh, again by the, uh, the a devotional guide published by the National United Church of Christ. We're not doing anything officially with them, but we just thought, let's feature some of those, those excellent writings. They're mm -hmm. just fa fantastic. If you want the whole devotional book, you can always go to the uh, ucc.org uh, website and, and order one there. They're pretty inexpensive. But, uh, it did say that it was unavailable when I just oh, went. Oh, so okay. Well, they sold, sold out, out fast last year, yeah. too. Well, never fear. But try. Fear. But try. You can always yeah. ask the UCC and see because it makes a great companion to this series. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but we will be featuring uh, uh, the readings from uh, that guide th throughout this series as well. So, right. we had a question of the week uh, yeah. that, that we derived like like people writing whole like journals yeah. this, this week on <laughs> they Facebook. They were yeah. pretty long answers actually, okay. but that was a good thing because what we were asking for was based on Quinn's family sing along, the idea about who is family to you and how do they, how do you respond to folks who are like family to you. Mm -hmm. So the actual question was. Tell us about someone who is like family to you. And Will Rainey, who is our social media director, mm -hmm. uh, does a lot of our, all of our Facebook and a bunch of other stuff, answered. His was Grandma Ruth. Grandma Ruth was our adopted grandma. My aunt lived next door to her when she first got a professional job in Michigan. When my aunt moved to Detroit, we continued to visit Ruth every weekend. When she passed away, she left her house to my parents, so when they retired, they decided to live out the rest of their lives the way Ruth did in her small cottage on a lake. Mm -hmm. Ruth lived to 99 years old, but she had a profound impact on our family. Mm. So that echoed quite a few of uh, the answers that we got from folks that were about um, extended family of some kind or another, either in-laws yeah. or ex-in-laws or, or good neighbors or all those kinds of people that aren't necessarily related by blood, but meant a lot to the family and had claim on some of the traditions and the heritage that they celebrate mm. during Advent. Yeah. Our second uh, response was from Michelle Morris. And she says, my friend Charlene is my chosen sister. We have known each other since our second semester in college, 41 years ago this January. We both ended as UM pastors. I'm assuming that means United Methodist. We are godmothers to each other's boys. We have both been widowed, our husband's dying of cancer. She has remarried. We each have each other's backs, even though we live two hours apart. I live in the town where she grew up, and she lives on the other side of the town where I grew up. Hmm. That's great. How's that for a connection during Advent? It's about those family connections that you don't even realize you have all the time, but they're always right there, kind of holding you and embracing you. Yeah. It's really kind of nice. Good reminder, we're never short of family. We can right. always choose uh, also uh, choose family, family members. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, That's great. Well, speaking of family, uh, you know, these genealogies that are, we, we find in both uh, Matthew's and Luke's Gospels of uh, tracing the, 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 the kind of lineage of Jesus um, are rather fascinating, and some of us wonder uh, where exactly they, they came from. You know, they uh, they both are very, very, very different from each other, and it makes it actually very hard to be a, a 
someone who holds to the literal inerrant interpretation of the Bible. Uh, when you look at uh, the genealogies in, in, um, in Matthew's and, and Luke's Gospels, because they're, they're in fundamental conflict with each other um, in, yeah. in a whole lot of uh, <laughs> places. Yeah, they can't even agree on who uh, Jacob's father uh, <laughs> was. Uh, but uh, if you're going to look at the genealogies to to discover what you know happened historically, well, lots of luck with that. You can Google on the internet and find all kinds of, uh, of elegant theories that put them all together, make them all mesh, but have are fraught with problems uh, underneath the surface. Um, but each one tells us something very distinctive and peculiar, or particular about uh, how each uh, of those authors, Matthew and Luke. Um, understand Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's really the, their way of saying, you know, especially Matthew, he starts his gospel with that, that, the, that uh, long genealogical list that um, has, uh, traces 14 generations from, well, he traces Jesus, uh, from uh, Abraham to, to Jesus. He's three sets of 14 generations. Wow. And, uh, and there, that's from Abraham to, to King David, then King David to the exile, and then exile to, uh, to Jesus. Which sounds pretty pretty elegant. I mean, 14 generations in each of those three great historical epics. It sounds it kind of makes this nice, smooth, kind of uh, sym symphony of salvation uh, uh, that God has has set up. You know, where Jesus is the culmination, and, and to Matthew and his community, who were uh, a lot of them would have been uh, Jewish uh, by birth. Um, it was very important to see that Jesus was in continuity with. The, the Hebrew tradition, uh, the Jewish tradition that was founded by uh, Abraham. And so you have this, this grand arc starting with Abraham. If you compare that to Luke's uh, genealogy, Luke, who's a Gentile um, and who's primarily speaking to a Gentile community, goes back be, beyond Abraham to Adam uh, down, down, and then ultimately to God, Jesus, son of Adam, son of God. And so kind of this radical expansion showing yeah. that uh, Hugely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Matthew's uh, narrative is not without that radical expansion too. If you look at some of the characters in it, you know he's he's got a, a he includes four women in his in his genealogy actually. But nice. uh, here, let me just put up. A, yeah, here's a kind of a schematic of Matthew's and and Luke's genealogies. If you put that up on the screen, there. So you've got. Um, uh, you got the, the from looking at, at David. Uh, you've got Matthew, who kind of traces then through Solomon, uh, David's son, and and down through Joseph and Jesus. And there you got uh, 26. You count the David 27. Uh, and then you've got on, on Luke's side, you see quite a lot more people from the same time <laughs> period. Da uh, yeah, but uh, uh, but uh, Luke is tracing the genealogy through. Uh, a n different son of David's, that's Nathan, and includes a whole lot more people uh, in, in his narrative. Um, but notice, like, you know, who's the son of, uh, uh, jo who's the father of Joseph? Joseph. Well, one uh, says Jacob, one says Eli, or Heli. Yeah. So, um, but again, these are not meant to tell us something that happened simply long ago, but rather telling us something of that, that they use, make use of the mythological imagination, that what, what happens continually. So what's happening continually, according to Luke, is that Jesus uh, from the beginning was, uh, was someone who, to whom we could all relate, whether we're Jew uh, or Gentile. One of those things that Matthew is trying to point out, uh, actually through those four women, uh, is that there's this also this radical expansion. If you look at those four women, um, anybody remember who those four women were? Okay, well one was... <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, okay. One, one was one was Ruth. And Ruth. And we have Bathsheba. Yep. That's a good one. Tamar. 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 Yep. Tamar. Tamar. Yep. Excellent. And who's the fourth? Who's the fourth? Rahab. Rahab. Rahab that's right. Nice. So uh, let's see here. Uh, Rahab, uh, prostitute in the uh, in the city of Jericho. Uh, <laughs> Tamar. This is the Tamar, not King David's daughter Tamar, but the Tamar from Genesis. Uh, 38, uh, who uh, has an incestuous sexual relationships while dressed with a prostitute with her father-in-law, Judah. Yeah. We have, uh, we have Ruth. Uh, now she kind of has this, this kind of goody-goody image where you read the book of Ruth and you find some interesting things happened on that threshing floor with Boaz. <laughs> And then you got, uh, <laughs> and then you've got. Uh, uh, that's that mythical imagination. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Inspiring of a lot of imagination there. And then you have. Um, <laughs> Bathsheba. Then you have Bathsheba, uh, yeah. and and of course uh, you know, she, she has an affair with, with King David. So um, you, it's interesting that that Matthew would 
you know, would throw in these four women, which is unusual anyway, which then draws your attention to them especially, right. and then you read about their stories and you're like, what? You know, what's he doing here? Why is he including these, these four in particular? Well, maybe we'll have reason to get into that a little later on in our episode. No doubt. Yeah. Well, before we go further, we want to also acknowledge a special guest uh, for the evening. We have Nomaly Brennett back here. She's been on tour. And uh, Nomaly, good to see you again. And I know that we're going to be hearing your guitar, but, uh, but not hearing your voice live because you just contracted some terrible disease or something like that that took away your voice. <laughs> no, but uh, we are going to be playing uh, one of Nomaly's um, uh, music video that really fit the theme of the episode a little later as well. And Carlos, you want to introduce the rest of the band? Oh, certainly, certainly. We have uh, Clark Edson on bass, mm -hmm. Matt Amandis on piano, and I'm Carlos Figueroa. And I think Nomaly's going to be dancing later instead of singing. Yeah, yeah I think she's, got, she's worked out some dancing, yeah. <laughs> excellent, that. excellent. That'll be, that'll be a dark brew first. Great. <laughs> well, uh, we, we want to. That one. That's right. Yeah. We did, we have had that on dark brews. Would not be without precedent. <laughs> well, uh, uh, before we go to to Quinn, we want to acknowledge that this is a uh, uh, not simply an internet television program or a gathering in a coffee house, but also it's a spiritual gathering where we seek to uh, seek insight from the Holy Spirit. And on that note, we invite you simply to uh, join us in taking a deep breath in letting it out slowly, and in so doing, clearing away whatever obstacles you may have brought to experiencing the presence of God in this episode as the band provides us just a few uh, moments of uh, time where we can simply get centered in that spirit. of the living Christ, we welcome your presence now with the lighting of this candle, whose flame brings warmth to winter and fills this place with the glow of hope. just witness our traditional lighting of the iPhone candle, which then went on power saver as that went on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we always have our little uh, quips with the iPhone candles. Refresh. But, yeah, that's right. Well, it's time to go to Quinn Caldwell. And uh, Quinn, it's great to have you back with us once again this year for Advent. I think we're, we're establishing a new Advent tradition right here. Nice. Thanks for having me back. It's an honor. <laughs> now, uh, Quinn, I think uh, the last time we, we, we touched in with you at Darkwood Brew, you had just moved from Old South Church in Boston up to Syracuse, and now you've been in, in Syracuse, New York. Uh, where? At Plymouth Congregational Church, yep, right downtown in Syracuse. Great. And what do you do for them there? Uh, I'm the pastor, and I'm the one and only. All right. And, and you were also a member of the Still Speaking writers group what is what is actually the nature of that that particular group well so, so some of you who are part of UCC congregations may remember about 10 years ago now we started a, a an identity campaign in the UCC called God is still speaking it was a reminder that God is alive and uh, would never dare to leave us alone with a dusty old book without uh, God's <laughs> living presence to blow new life through it and uh, so that um, we, we we thought that was a sort of unique witness and we wanted to get that out there in the world and so we had uh, sort of media blitz around that and then a, a group of writers was uh, invited to, to work on um, doing what they call deepening theological reflection around the Still Speaking campaign. And so uh, that's us. So we produce, um, it, it ended up that mostly what we produce is little pamphlet things. And then our most popular thing is a daily email uh, devotional. And then uh, in, in Advent and Lent every year, we have um, these ones that, uh, that you were talking about, uh, a paper devotional. Mm. Uh, so here's the one for Advent for this year. Yeah, 
And yeah, those uh, daily devotions are quite popular too. I know uh, we have a staff meeting every every week, and and a devotional start that. And it's not at all infrequent that a staff member will read from one of those devotionals. How do you sign it for that? If you, if you if you'll be, anybody can sign it for that that, or do you have to be a member of the UCC or or what? To be a writer? No, to, or, to sign it for the daily devotional. Oh no, you just go to ucc.org and right on the, the front page there, there's a link for you to sign up and it'll come into your email uh, box every day or you can follow it on Facebook and get them that way. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of, uh, of, of like daily emails and stuff except for uh, your group. <laughs> you guys really do a good job uh, Thanks. with that. So. So you uh, invited us at the front of this episode to think uh, about Christmas um, through song through uh, what, what 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 inspired you to, to look back at, at, at song in, in your life well so uh, song in general I think is important but if, the songs of this season seem to open people up in a way that uh, uh, other kinds of music just don't seem to do so th certainly that's true for myself you know the the songs that I learned in my childhood both the religious ones and the secular ones of this season are uh, buried deep written deep on my heart but I also notice it in my own congregation there'll be these people that never sing all year long and I you know I don't always know why though I have my suspicions and they'll stand <laughs> there maybe with the hymnal open or maybe not and they I don't think they know it but they always look so grumpy they're just like you know, just refusing to sing. And then Advent comes and they're like belting it, you know, <laughs> and um, it, and it's just so clear, you know, from my vantage point, sitting up front, looking out at the congregation. And uh, so I, I know I'm not alone <laughs> in thinking these songs are important. And so I just got thinking about who who taught us those songs? Where do, where do we learn them? How do they uh, climb deep into our hearts? And often it's family members, you know, it's, it's whatever uh, your parents or whoever put on the, the record player or the radio when you were decorating a tree when you were little, though hopefully it's church too if you were a, a church-going person growing up. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I was reflecting on that myself and was realizing you know, I came from a musical family. My father was a, a high school band director when I was a really young child and but for me, the, the, the songs of Christmas weren't so much through the singing of songs, but then through the, the playing of them. I, was, uh, I went out back through my uh, photo archives, actually, and, and found uh, my father used to organize the Illness Family Band along with some other uh, folks. Uh, we would gather from the, from the community, from friends, and, and you put that photograph up on the, on the screen there. Um, this is actually a, a photograph of, the, of my uh, family um, uh, playing door-to-door uh, -door through, I mean, just different shut-ins in the community and so forth who were, uh, I think, kind of terrorized by our music because we, we weren't very good. <laughs> but uh, my father was, uh, like, say, a, a band director. That's him on the trombone. And my godfather was also a band director. That's him on the baritone uh, there. And, um, you know, they just, and my brother, he, he got in on, on the act, too. He's playing the trumpet there. And my mom is holding music for my goddaughter, on the, uh, god, uh, god daughter, god uh, sister. Uh, over there, and there's no picture of me, unfortunately, from that time period, because I'm taking the pictures, but I do have a picture of me from a few years later there. I'm the dork on the right playing the clarinet, but but um, my father would, would um, you get, assemble us and we'd be squeaking and squawking and, and the weather would frequently be cold so we'd be out of tune. <laughs> but, and yet that's really what connected me uh, and my family uh, very much to the, the, those, the musical story of, of, of Christmas. And, um, and then my father had actually uh, commissioned a, an artist in the congregation to create a sculpture of the Illness Family Band. Here, I've got some pieces here. I, you're, you're, your piece just, you're, I, I fished them out of my basement <laughs> after I read your, your, your piece there. My father is- Your basement? Why are they in your basement? Yeah, well, because when that. we moved to Omaha, the, the, actual, the actual assemblage broke and, and I've been meaning, I need, to get, I need to get it fished. But this is my father who's like wearing a you know, tuxedo. He's got his, his you know, his, best clothes on but then you look at uh, for instance uh, there's here's my brother he's kind of slouched over with his trumpet with his cheeks all puffed out here's my my mother let's see here if we get that my mother's got her uh, bathrobe on and the fuzzy slippers and then uh, are they rabbits? no they're not no. rabbits no and then my, there and there's me with my puffed out cheek on my clarinet Ooh, wait, I can't I can't quite oh there we go uh, there we go and I've That's got I'm, I'm sitting in a chair and my hook foot is hooked around the chair but if you saw the original assemblage 
my father has sheet music that has uh, Beethoven uh, on it. And then if you look behind our music stands, um, it had Polly Wally Doodle. <laughs> <laughs> And so anyway, that, was my, that was my connection to, to Christmas. But I kind of thought, you know, that kind of sounds to me like Matthew's um, narrative in what, many ways. You know, Matthew kind of has this, my father's aspect, like the grand 14, you know, generations 14 times 3. Looks very beautiful in God's salvation symphony. But then you look underneath the surface, you've got these strange characters <laughs> in it that he's thrown in there. And yet it all is meant to make beautiful music. And, you know, in... in both that one and in Luke's version, you know, re relatives are everywhere. Mary goes to visit her her cousin, her relative Elizabeth. Um, Joseph and Mary presumably stay with family when they go to Bethlehem. You know, it's his hometown, so we assume that uh, they they must have or probably still had relatives there. And so that s sometimes the family is really clear on the f surface of the story, but sometimes they're sort of assumed uh, behind. And and you just have to think that they made music together. You know, it's it's. Uh, uh, a very uniquely human thing uh, mm -hmm. to to make music together, to be able to sing, you know, in time to have a, uh, a a way to sing together. There are lots of animals that sing and they can sing at each other, but only humans have a, a precise and a shared sense of rhythms that allows us to sing together. So um, you, you, you can claim, and I do claim, that it's a uniquely human thing to do. So I just have to think that in, in those families they did that. And this song, the Magnificat, that that Mary sings, we know it's uh, uh, an evolution from an earlier song from back in the Hebrew Scriptures. But uh, presumably, somebody taught it to her if she was able to sing it. So you know, maybe it was Elizabeth, maybe it was her parents. Uh, who knows? But I, I bet it was a family member. Mm, that's right. So, did you have any uh, uh, any particular uh, songs or carols that were uh, formative for you uh, growing up? That were taught to you by a family member or relative? <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, and my, as I say in my devotional, my, I remember really clearly my mom singing Silent Night and uh, uh, one of my sisters, I have more than one sister, but one of them in particular uh, teaching me, O come all ye faithful, and then um, my, my grandmother really loved, really loved, no matter, you know, it so it's so schmaltzy, but she just loved uh, the little drummer boy. So, you know, if I heard the little drummer boy in a vacuum now, I would be like, what is that? But um but since my grandmother loved it, I, I love it. <laughs> yeah, great. Chris, did, were, there, were there any uh, favorite songs from, or carols from your childhood? Um, yeah, well, we used to sit around and watch all the Christmas specials together, so there oh, were yeah. a lot of things. But one of the things that really stuck out for me that I can remember is sitting with my grandmother and watching David Bowie and Bing Crosby singing Little Drummer Boy together. Oh, you remember that one? That's uh, yeah. like the classic piece. So That's Little right. Drummer Boy is a favorite of mine yeah. as well. Yeah. for that reason. But I remember fourth grade um, when the schools used to carol around the neighborhood. Did any of you guys ever do that? The schools? No. The schools, no. yeah. Our schools always had groups of kids that would go out and have the, you know, the UNICEF box and carol around the neighborhood and then end up at somebody else's house for hot chocolate and marshmallows. And So I got to know my neighbors as well as my school friends on a much better basis because of that, I think. Hmm. That was fun. That's cool. The, the, your school carol uh, when you were when you were a kid, <laughs> Quinn. No, uh, yeah, we did actually. You it was did. A public oh. school too. Wow. But, oh yeah, yeah. Well, the the chorus or the choir yeah. or whatever. So if you were part of it, we got shoved out into the cold and yeah, went door yeah. to door. Yeah. Now over the years in my school systems and, and especially as I had children, then they they increasingly kind of made it holiday concerts and they kind of eliminated all of the all yeah. of the uh, the the. The kind of the traditional Christmas music from those, and which I always yeah. thought was disappointing. I totally understand and support the separation of church and state uh, for sure, but I always kind of thought you know it would be much more honoring of that by featuring many traditions uh, songs rather than trying to make it all then about Frosty the Snowman and Santa Claus as if that somehow solved the church yeah. and state issue. I think they try to mix it up now a little bit, but I'm older than you, that's why I still got to do it before you did. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, we will we'll be uh, uh, returning with Quinn in a, in a few minutes and, and actually looking at the Magnificat of Mary a bit, a bit uh, more closely and, and the different things that it may tell us and not tell us about uh, Jesus. And we might even uh, spring over into Matthew's, uh, that, that uh, strange genealogy of, of Matthew's as well. Uh, so let's uh, hear 
uh, that scripture once again. We're going to actually hear it uh, once read by Tracy. And uh, as you hear it, uh, pay attention to any word or phrase that may stick in your mind. Um, we're going to hear it once, and then you'll see it also uh, on the screen silently one other time. And we'll invite you, uh, as then we'll be featuring the, the music video from Nomaly, to simply turn uh, that word or phrase around in your mind, asking, you know, why did that stick? You know, what is it, what is it trying to tell you in your particular situation right now? And, and then afterwards, we'll be back with Quinn. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on my, the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. What is the word or phrase that stuck uh, in your heart? Uh, we invite you to continue that contemplation as we hear a musical reflection by Anomaly Brennett from a concert in 2008, which could very well have been a reflection on this very uh, Magnificat. These are my dreams. To all the tough girls And here's to all the sensitive boys We belong And here's to all the rejects And here's to all the misfits to all the one hit one 
blunders and here's to all the mistakes and the blunders we belong and here's to all the fashion don'ts and here's to all the Friday night home alone we belong Minorities, and here's to those who chose diversity. We belong, we belong, and when the same own voices say that we be. Thank you, Anomaly. That looked like a little more recent than 2008, I think. Yeah, I think it was last year. Oh, okay. I know I saw one on YouTube that's from 2008 of that same song. So, good, good. Uh, that really does seem like a, it could have been written uh, in conversation with uh, DARPA Brew tonight. Well, let's go back to uh, Quinn Caldwell and we'll, we'll do a little reflecting on this Magnificat and, and belonging. Quinn, good to have you back again. Hey. <laughs> so, uh, was there a, a, a verse or a line that, that really, um, or a word that, or two that resonated with you during that Numa Divina reading? Well, so this passage is my very favorite piece of the entire Bible. So, ah. you know, in, in a way, the, the whole thing resonates with me every time I hear it. But uh, often, and this time, uh, that word magnifies mm -hmm. <laughs> just struck me. I, you know, I, the, the mystery of how um, a, a human could make the the creator of heaven and earth bigger or or easier to see um is is, is mind-boggling to me you know it's a it's a true mystery and one that i i love to dwell in and just you know let my mind spin on um and, and obviously one way mary did it was with her body you know bearing god uh you know letting god grow in her body and be born into the world but then the question is you know how do the rest of us uh do that mm. so magnifies that's the word yeah so so how do the rest of us do that what are some some of the ways that 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 idea of magnifying God uh, moves you. Well, so you know, one way to, to talk about magnifying God is, or another way to say that is to make God easier to see in the world. And one way to do that is to do what uh, John John the Baptist did and just point, <laughs> say, "Hey, everybody, look over there. There's God right there." When, when we see it, um, or or when we become convinced that that God's revealing Herself in the world, just to draw everyone's attention to it. And I think that's what preachers do all the time, but it's, or are trying to do all the time, but it's something everybody's supposed to be doing. Um, and, and then just being like loud and unafraid about God and, and our faith in God, whatever it is, whether you believe a little or uh, believe a lot, uh, whether you're, um, you know, a, a questioning believer, believer, believe in questioner, you know, whatever it is that, that you hold to be true about God to, to say it out loud so that people can hear it. Um, and then, you know, with our actions, of course, you know, I'm, this, I'm from the UCC where we talk about this all the time, um, just living as, as best we can as if God were real in the world and present in the room with us. Mm, yeah. 
that's a nice uh, also I think to think about magnifying uh, God in the sense we're not creating some sort of presence we're simply noticing you know uh, it starts with noticing something that, that already is there that we're not having to manufacture we're not having to make up in our minds whatever but but actually paying attention uh, to what's going on and then naming it oftentimes uh, something doesn't become visible until we name it uh, in, in some way kind of mag bring it out into the open yeah there you know so, um some people talk about trying to, to make their lives into windows through which the world can get a glimpse of God and, um, at, you know, windows, not doors. <laughs> uh, there's that old thing, you know, when, when somebody's standing in front of a television screen or whatever and you're trying to watch it, you say, you'd make a better door than a window, right? <laughs> so um, at least that's what my sister always said to me. So you um, you, you you try to make a, of your life a window, but maybe, maybe just a slightly convex window so that people aren't just seeing God, but it's easier to see God because, because of your presence there, which is sort of a, uh, you know, um, a, a big claim to make for yourself that it's possible to make God easier to see in the world through your life. On, on the other hand, why are we here if not for that? You know, why, why bother doing any of that if that's not what we're uh, called to do? That's yeah. not the point of this. Seems like oftentimes in the Christian community, we're, we're really good at being doors rather than windows into the presence of God in our midst. Um, yeah, locked ones. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I wonder if there might even be a word of, of hope in that, um, in, in certain respects, if we kind of, uh, you're looking at, um, at Mary's Magnificat in, in the, her reflection that, that uh, you know, God has brought down the mighty and powerful from the thrones and lifted up the, the lowly, you know, so, so oftentimes, you know, of course, that's really a reference to the powerless. But I also think um, if, we, if we compare that with Matthew's genealogy, lifting up the lowly doesn't necessarily mean um, only powerless. It can also mean that God is revealed in the stumbling and around that we all do when we, even when we are trying, when we, our lives become somehow doors to the presence of God. Somehow, God is able to, uh, to, to link us to a larger narrative that actually provides even our, our door-like characteristics makes them a window. Um, when I look at uh, those, you know, the, the people in, in, in the narrative, for instance, take uh, you know, Bathsheba. I mean, they're like, why does he have an adulterous woman in the narrative? You know? Well, you know, actually, I think that, that um, in, in that, that story, it's not really Bathsheba that's got the problem. It's King David. You know, the whole, you know, Matthew's characterization of Jesus' lineage is very David-centered. You know, there's 14 generations to David and then two sets of 14 after him. And, and, and the numerological value of the word David is 14. And so um, you've got a lot of emphasis on David. And yet David is, um, is really the, the one who seeks after Bathsheba while her husband's away, um, seeks to sleep with her. She's probably just trying to protect uh, her husband's life in actually uh, acquiescing to his um, his advances, um, worried that if he if she displeases the king, while well, he her husband's out fighting his wars, her husband can can uh, 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 David has control over his life, and and then he impregnates her. Then he's trying to cover it up, doesn't work, and so then he ends up killing her husband in the process. I mean, David is you know, and and when Matthew talks about the Jesus's lineage, he doesn't even refer to Bathsheba by name. He refers to Bathsheba by the name of her dead husband, the, the wife of Uriah, and or you know, really pointing out the the adultery that took place, and and you know here he's built this beautiful symphony of salvation, you know right around David, the lineage of David, and yet he's also fingering David as uh, both a murderer and an adulterer. It's like whoa, you know there's a door to <laughs> a door to God right there, and yet somehow it becomes part of this salvation story. Well, yeah, and there's all these people, especially the women who who break the rules, right? Not, not, none of these women are uh, w would um, be easily welcomed by your average, well-behaved church person. <laughs> I don't think you know it's it's hookers and adulterers and and uh, people who don't follow the rules. You know, they, I imagine they all had that bumper sticker on their car: "Well-behaved women seldom make history." Right? right. <laughs> um, all, all four of these women had that bumper sticker. I'm sure of it. And and God, the the um, Gospel writer wants to point that out. I think you know it's a it's a little subversive um, nudge and, and celebration of of women who don't follow the rules and like like Mary herself, right? You know she she's uh, singing this song about um, th this 
remarkably powerful song. You know, it's so easy to just sort of let this trip off your tongue and not see the the power in it and uh, the the anger that you just have to assume that that she was saying it with the anger at the state of the world. We, um, you and I talked earlier, Eric, about um, how uh, you, this. Uh, bringing down the powerful from their thrones and lifting up the lowly, scattering the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. Surely she taught this stuff to Jesus. You know, mm -hmm. we, sometimes we think that Jesus got everything he knows about God directly from God or whatever. But I, I think he learned a lot of it at Mary's knee. And and don't you think he might have been singing this song when he was overturning the tables of the money changers uh, in, in the temple? Don't you think he, he might have been humming this to himself as he was, you know, <laughs> whipping the, the, the people right out of the temple? I, love that. I do. You know, I think I think Mary taught him to think that way. Love that. That's a great image of Jesus seeing the Magnificat while he's overturning the tables in, in the temple. It certainly would fit. Uh, that image actually seems more accurate to the, the memory of that Magnificat than some of the, the beautiful, sweet-sounding glosses we give of it in, in modern times. It really is a, a, a song of revolution, uh, not some warm, fuzzy kind of a Christmas carol. Amen. Mm. How do we get back into that spirit of revolution today, uh, Quinn, or, or, or is there a need to uh, in your mind? Uh, well, you know, in a, in a small way, even um, singing songs of the faith during the secular Christmas season <laughs> is revolutionary. You know, even paying it, deciding to open a book and pay attention to this, deciding to gather with, uh, with other people um, and, and ask the kinds of questions we're talking about right now is is an act of revolution against the the you know the retailers that that open earlier and or, or you know start the Christmas sales earlier and earlier every year. It's a, it's an act of revolution against our children who are demanding you know the the Christmas presents they want and and maybe against our our worst selves as well who get so uh, caught up in in that which does not signify in in this season. So just e even remembering uh, Mary at all, I think, is a touch revolutionary. Mm, yeah, it's a good, good, good beginning there. Yeah, I was really struck this year, uh, in particular at Thanksgiving time, when uh, we, more and more retailers were opening uh, their doors for the Black Friday sale on Thanksgiving Day itself, and, and quite early in the day, even at, at, at that, it seemed like, you know, I never thought I'd live to see the day when actually just simply sitting at a table with your family for offering thanks for Thanksgiving meal was as much a countercultural statement as it, as it was anything else. It's like, what on earth is going on? You know. Yeah. I've uh, actually, uh, I'll throw this out as a suggestion. Maybe somebody out on out in internet land will take me up on that. I, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if even just simply uh, you know, some of us put up um, websites that simply listed the, the places in our community that were uh, opening on, you know, for s trying to sell us a bunch of stuff on, on Thanksgiving Day uh, and, the, and the retailers that didn't. And, and maybe we had a petition that said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to, if you're open on Thanksgiving Day, I'm going to boycott you not only on Thanksgiving Day, but also on Black Friday that you're hoping to get me to. And then and we'll go uh, frequent those businesses that, that are at least saying, hey, people deserve a break and we all need to give thanks bit more you know I don't actually mind that they open up if people want to shop you know they they can shop I, I it, it strikes me as very sad if that's the best the very best thing you can do think of to, to do with your time on that day but um I it, but I'm I intend to to try to balance that drive to to go out and you know spend and spend and spend and accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. Uh, I, it's, it's not totally terrible. I love shopping. <laughs> I love buying presents. I love giving presents. So I don't want to be one of those pe pastors that's always just yeah. like, uh, you know, railing against it. I, I, I think it's okay, but I, but, uh, there, there's a reason we're doing it and, and, uh, and it, sh it should be making you delighted <laughs> when you're doing it. And when it stops making you delighted and you're just sort of harried and desperate and, and, grumpy, um, that's the time to, to look at uh, why you're doing it and, and try to remember, um, you know, Mary singing the song or, or whoever singing the songs of the season uh, to you the first time and try to recapture that sort of delight uh, and, and celebrate that way. Yeah, yeah. So as you look ahead at, at Christmas, are there, are there particular ways that you uh, engage in uh, that revolutionary uh, uh, way of uh, remembering uh, the story? Uh, yeah, so we try to um, 
be intentional about teaching our son this story, you know, raising a kid that's, that's gentle and angry, <laughs> uh, that's, um, that's, that's mad about the way the world is, but, but committed to trying to change it, um, in, in forceful, firm, powerful, and gentle ways, peaceful ways, um, uh, trying to, to be a family that, um, bathes ourselves in love and generosity and not sort of greed and accumulation and um and then teach, <laughs> teaching our kid and each other the songs that our parents taught us mm, sounds great well uh we will in addition to doing things like that we'll be also following uh the writings of the still speaking Write writers group in the uh advent uh, devotional appreciate your own contributions to that and appreciate you being on darkwood brew once again this year thanks for having me back Looking back to that that uh, narrative in in Matthew's gospel, in which he's you know lifts out those four women, one of the things that really strikes me is that we, it's kind of like in God's symphony of salvation, you hear the squawks of those four uh, women who have have these uh, rather uh, uh, curious uh, uh, things they've done, each of a sexual nature. But what strikes me as even more revealing of what Matthew's trying to tell us is that when you actually look at those stories, rather than simply getting all titillated by their, uh, you know, their, their story, so to speak, um, you start actually looking at the narrative. You read Genesis 38, where Tamar uh, is here, her story is found, or you read uh, the book of Ruth, where Ruth's stories come from, or you read uh, uh, Joshua chapter 2, where uh, Rahab's story is found, or you read about uh, David and Bathsheba. Bottom line is, you look in those stories and the women themselves are not shown to be the ones who are immoral so much as the, the people around them, the society that is treated as acceptable, uh, really overturned. So for instance, we focus on Bathsheba the adulterer. Well, no, actually, David <laughs> is far more implicated. The Bible itself um, points to David. Um, you know, here is um, the one who Matthew is focused on as the, the key to Jesus' lineage, and he is an adulterer and a murderer. It seems that uh, God, in God's own symphony of salvation, is a bit like, um, well, a bit like my dad, quite frankly, in the Elnis family band, you know, directing this, this masterful symphony, but it's got full of those squeaks and squawks uh, in it, and intentionally so. It seems that the way Matthew is worded his narrative that picks up then on Mary's Magnificat, is that if you, if you ask yourself, are you, you know, can you be a member of God's family, uh, that genealogy would suggest that the question is not, do you measure up? You know, are you good enough to be a member of the, the community of God? But do you think you're too good for it? You know, in a sense, we all have to realize that we can just as much be doors to, um, to you know, block you know, the view of God as we can be magnifiers of that. And oftentimes in our, in our society, we reject the community of God because there's so many doors and so few people magnifying that. And yet what this story tells us as we remember it in a revolutionary way is that if we, if we take ourselves out of community because we're just so disgusted by all the doors rather than the magnifiers, uh, we have just made that statement that Matthew is hoping we will not make, that we are too good for that. That the only question about whether you're part of God's family is, is uh, you know, the only people who absent themselves are people who think they're, they're too good for it. Uh, there is no, are you good enough to be part of it? Because God can make a symphony out of us all. You know, every week at Darkwood Brew, we celebrate uh, the, the, uh, this, this final meal of Jesus, known as communion. And I think that, you know, if, if we didn't get, it, get the message out of Matthew's genealogy or Mary's Magnificat, um, we certainly get it here in this meal. And we invite you to share it with us tonight if you're on the Internet uh, and have bread and wine or juice and crackers at home. We remember on a night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took this bread and he broke it, saying, My friends, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. So likewise, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. 
by eating this bread and drinking this cup, we remember Christ's death, we celebrate Christ's resurrection, and we know that when this, this meal is offered to the whole world, we know certainly none of us is a stranger to the community of God. That the only ones of us who ever are outside of that community are outside of that by our own choice, not by God's choice. Your own partaking of this meal tonight uh, represents God's choice of you. We invite you to enjoy the feast. Thank you, Anomaly and the Bruise Brothers, once again. And uh, even Anomaly, you're fantastic even without your voice. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Well, my friends, uh, next week we'll be joined by Donna Scopper. She's also been on Darkwood Brew during Advent uh, last year and is a member of the Steel Speaking uh, Writers Group as well. She's also the Senior Minister of Judson Memorial Church in New York City. Until then, my friends, may the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to push you into places you may not necessarily go yourself, go beneath you to uphold you and uplift you, go beside you to be your constant companion, and dwell within you to remind you that you are surely not alone, and you are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you, now and always. Amen. <laughs>